first uh, presentation is by Zachary Gardner. Uh, joining us from Pennsylvania, although present, not uh, not remote, so that's great. Uh, Zachary has a wide range of flag interests and is also presenting at his first annual meeting. In addition to NAVA, Zachary belongs to the Chesapeake Bay Flag Association and is presenting his paper on From Oppression to Pride, How Former Colonies Embraced Colonial Symbols. Zachary, over to you. Um, it's a pleasure to be up here with everyone today, and uh, I'm extremely excited to be in a room filled with people who enjoy flags as much as I do. So without further ado, my presentation is From Oppression to Pride, How Former Colonies Embrace Colonial Symbols. All right, so an introduction. In the 1940s, the United Nations only had 35 members. However, within a span of 24 years, that number drastically rose to 127. And this quick uh, increase in nation states can be directly attributed to the rapid decolonization by European powers throughout Africa and Asia. Um, as these nations began joining uh, the United Nations and began being recognized as nation states, they also took up different type of flags in order to help unify the people, which would eventually become their national flags, which most countries use today. Almost every single nation which gained independence from a European power took after a flag during their period of independence or at independence. So when researching the different ways that these flags were created, I noticed that many flags from formerly, in, uh, formerly colonized nations utilized symbols from their European empires. And I thought this was very interesting since you would feel like if you were becoming independent from a previous nation, you'd want to separate yourselves as far away as possible. But in many cases, this was not the case. So I found three different examples of how uh, formerly colonized nations utilized European symbolism in order to help represent their own country or territory. In some cases, the occupied, the formerly occupied nation um, embraced the European symbols because of the great culture from Europe that was now residing within uh, the formerly colonized nation. And I'm going to see, we're going to see an example of that today uh, in the presentation. Um, in other examples, the occupying country utilized symbolism, which appealed to the native population. And so once they finally became an independent nation, they took back these symbols, which the European empires used. And we're going to see two examples of that. And in other cases, the nations changed the symbols used by Europeans, which represented European colonialism in order to help better represent their own personal nation. The adoption of flags of former colonies is a complex topic which shows the different ways a symbol of oppression can become a symbol of independence and national pride. All right, a quick introduction. So a background to European hegemony. European hegemony can first be uh, ascribed to the establishment of trading ports along the coast of Africa and Asia. Once the New World was discovered, meaning the Americas and the West Indies, um, they've, the European nations, mostly Western European nations during this time period, felt that there is a great land to explore and to exploit economically and to help advance them and keep them relevant within the uh, global uh, hemisphere. And throughout the 1800s, however, Central and South America slowly became more and more independent leaving only the Caribbean and Canada being occupied by a foreign European nation. After this, in a desire to remain economically relevant, nations began taking over um, parts of Africa and parts of Asia. And one important conference was the conference at Berlin, in which European countries met together and they partitioned off parts of Africa so that they each could uh, so that they could each exploit it in their own way. And three major nations which did so, the first one being Spain, who lost many of their territories during the Spanish-American War, decided to take parts of Morocco and Spanish Guinea. 
Britain began colonizing through uh, trade companies, however, began directly uh, exploiting uh, the land through direct colonization. And the Congo River Basin was undesired by most of the European nations. And so Belgium decided to take that and use that for mining and for exporting things like rubber and ivory. European colonization is a story of powerful nations desiring economic control. While most colonies proved to be more economically detrimental to keep, Europe held control over many colonies until the late 1900s. All right, national flags stem from Europe. While the use of flags can be seen throughout Asia and originating in these areas, the idea of a national flag mostly came out of the idea of heraldry during, in Europe during this time period in order to help unify the culture of people within that country and to help uh, create a stronger sense of national pride for things such as war or just helping out with the economy. And since these national flags withstood time, they also utilized flags in these former colonies in order to represent their overseas territories. So Spain initially utilized flags such as the Spanish saltire, which is very, uh, which you can see throughout St. Augustine. Um, Britain used various ensigns containing the Union Jack in the Canton and France used either the Royal Standard or the French Tricolor to represent its colonies. All right, the creation of these flags to represent these people, uh, to represent groups of people stems directly from the European colonization. And this can probably be the reason why many former colonized nations utilize these European uh, symbols because they found that if that helped create a sense of national pride for their people, then it can help unify the people in this nation. And in many of these former, formerly colonized nations, Europe grouped together many different ethnicities and cultures, and so it was necessary to create these strong uh, national symbols in order, to uni uh, um, in order to form a unity between the various cultures and ethnicities within the area. Had Europe not been the country to enact colonization, we would not see national flags to the extent that we see them today as a common symbol for all nations. All right, the first flag that I would like to talk about is, well, the first symbol I would like to talk about is the fleur de lis on the flag of Quebec. To begin talking about Quebec, we have to first talk about the colony of New France, which was established in 1608 and was primarily used in order to help uh, economically help France, as previously, state, as previously stated, and to secure trading networks in the Atlantic Ocean. And the major export within this area were, um, were um, furs, and they utilized many different uh, companies throughout New France in order to help export these furs and economically benefit France. However, France deemed that New France was too unprofitable to keep. And so after the Seven Years' War uh, between France and Britain, New France was given up to Britain. And this was all done before the French Revolution. So there wasn't a strong sense of national pride for France in New France during this time period until the 1900s when Quebec had a strong French heritage renaissance, cultural renaissance during this time period and they felt a stronger sense of unity within their French culture. All right, the old flag of Quebec. The old flag of Quebec was simply a blue British ensign containing the uh, coat of arms of Quebec. And um, the majority of Canadians or, or Quebecers didn't like this because they felt that there was no representation of their French heritage. And so they decided to fly the French tricolor in protest to this flag. All right, eventually in 1948, they adopted a new flag and this flag was reportedly based on two different flags which were have said to have flown in New France during the, time of col during the time of colonization. The naval flag of the Kingdom of France, which I don't know if the red one will work on this, is right here, it has the white, it took up the white cross and then the Royal Banner of France, which took the three fleurs de lis onto 
the four cantons of the flag. And many French-speaking Canadians throughout Canada felt that they needed to also represent their heritage, even though they weren't in Quebec. And so they also took after the fleur-de-lis on their own flag. So we can see the Franco-Ontarian flag utilizes a fleur-de-lis as well as a trillium, which represents Ontario. The Francescoi flag, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, is uh, utilized the fleur de -lis along with the green cross representing Catholicism. And the Franco-Albertan flag utilized the fleur de -lis along with a red rose, which represents Alberta. So why did Quebec embrace the fleur de -lis, the symbol which formerly represented uh, col colonization? Uh, quite uh, simply, it was because that was the major, the majority culture within Quebec during this time period. The uh, majority of First Nations people who lived here during this time were either relocated or they were re-educated and put back into Canadian society. And so the majority of people during this time period um, when making the flag were very proud of their French culture and almost all of them had some sort of French heritage leading back to New France. So the existence of the majority of culture with strong tie to the empire is the reason why Quebec embraced their colonial symbol. The, the next flag I would like to talk about is, well, the next symbol I would like to talk about is the Seal of Solomon found on the flag of the Republic of the Rif. All right, a brief history of the Republic of, of the Rif Republic. So the Rift Republic was a uh, temporary uh, nation which gained independence in 1921 from the Spanish Protectorate. The Spanish Protectorate was established by Spain in Morocco due to their recent losses of during the Spanish-American War of uh, nations like the Philippines. And they were scared that a, having French territory underneath of them and above them would, lead, would cause a... Um, would make them be vulnerable to attack from both sides. And so eventually the, they began working deeper and deeper into rift territory. They began exploiting the people and they began mining there. And the tribes in this area did not like that at all. And so they revolted and established their own nation in 1921. And they maintained this nation until 1926 when they lost it at the Battle of al -Huesemas. All right, so the flag flown in, during, in the Spanish protectorate during this time period was the merchant flag of Morocco. This flag was flown because the flag of Morocco was actually banned by Spain in order to decrease the amount of nationalism that the people in this area might have. And the flag was described as a red flag defaced on the top part and hoist side with a rectangle uh, that is a natural green color rectangle bearing on its center, the five pointed seal of Solomon in white. And that seal is going to be very important uh, because the seal of Solomon was used during this time period as a testament to, to the faith of Islam, which many of the people living in the tribes in the Rif were, uh, were a member of. And in comparison to the flag of the Spanish protectorate, the flag of the Rif Republic of the Rift Republic, as seen on the bottom, utilized a white diamond with a green crescent and a green seal of Solomon next to it in the center of the flag. So why is this slight difference important? So the change of white to green represented and putting, placing it in the center of the flag along with the crescent represented a statement made by the Rift people against the expansion of the Catholic Church who were trying to uh, convert all, the, all of the people in the rift during the time to Catholicism. And so they were basically changing the seal of Solomon to be placed in the center of the flag to show that their faith is at the center of the people and that they were, that they, that it was an, um, that it was, that they were in, they were supposed to be in a moving barrier in Morocco as to protect all the other Muslims in Morocco from Spanish forces, trying to convert them and exploit them. And so, yeah, so the current flag of Morocco was adopted in 1915, but like I said, it was banned in Spain. 
And however, it made a resurgence in 1956 after Morocco's independence. And on this flag, they also had a green seal of Solomon in the center representing the faith. And today, 99% of Moroccans are reportedly Muslim, showing how they kept their faith in the center of their culture of people, even during times of oppression and occupation by Spain. The flag of the Rift Republic serves as an ex excellent example of a minute yet deliberate change in the symbol of a colonial flag to positively solidify the state's necessity for independence and its difference between itself and its occupant. The next flag or the next symbol that I would like to talk about is the star found on the flag of Congo Leopoldville. All right, a brief history of Congo Leopoldville. It was uh, originally a former member of the Belgian Congo, and it was extremely rep repressive and, or it was extremely oppressive colony, exploiting most of the original native people living in there during the time period. And however, many pol African political parties began rioting in the 1960s and demanding independence, and eventually Congo Leopoldville was established, which was a de temporary democratic republic. All right, flags of the Congo. The first flag of the Congo was used in 1877, described as a blue flag with a golden star in its center. However, once Congo Leopoldville was established in 1960, it added uh, six stars to represent the six provinces of the Congo. And before Congo Leopoldville was named the Democratic Republic of the Congo, it utilized a new flag containing a red stripe with gold fimbriation, moving the star to the top left. So many people believe that the star represented a symbol of racism and a, as in a beacon of civilization within the dark lands of Africa, meaning that Europe was coming to help civilize these people, going again from the idea of the civilizing mission of the Belgians. How, and by flying this flag, King Leopold assumed the title of savior to the uncivilized people in Africa that he was going to civilize them. However, the star on the new flag of the Congo no longer represented this. Rather, they changed the symbolism, which originally represented oppression uh, in, their, in their nation, to serve as a beacon of hope and a radiant future for the people of the Congo. Now, the flag of the Congo temporarily changed, as you can see right here, to represent a more African nation after a coup by, uh, by uh, Mobuto and the creation of the nation of Zaire. However, once Zaire collapsed, they once again readopted a flag, uh, the flag of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which used a lighter blue color, but it was the same structure. Well, it was once a symbol of European power, now represented a greater and progressive future for the Congolese people. At the flag's creation, the star represented a newly free country run by its native people, shining in the light of colonial Africa. The next country I'm going to, or the next symbol I'm going to be talking about is the Zimbabwe bird found on the flag of Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. So a brief history of Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. It was a temporary unrecognized parliamentary republic, which was established in 1979 after a long war known as the Rhodesian Bush War. So the country was originally the colony of British Southern Rhodesia. However, the nation of Rhodesia gained independence from British Southern Rhodesia. However, the native Africans of this area did not really like this idea because it was still run by a minority white uh, government and they felt that it would still remain oppressive towards them. And so a war ensued and eventually they gained independence in the, in the nation of Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. Flags of, flags of the Rhodesia. So the, Brit, the flag of British Southern Rhodesia was originally just the flag, uh, the blue British ensign, along with the coat of arms of Rhodesia. And however, once Rhodesia gained independence, the flag got rid of the Union Jack, but kept the coat of arms of Rhodesia in the center of the flag. And finally, at the, finally at the uh, independence of Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, they utilized a much different flag. However, they kept the great Zimbabwe bird on it from the coat of arms. So why is this important? The Great Zimbabwe bird was a powerful uh, symbol 
within the people of Zimbabwe during this time period from the uh, old Zimbabwe empire, which once ruled there. And the coat of arms, which was used by these two nations before Zimbabwe Rhodesia was the coat of arms of Cecil Rhodes, who was a British explorer and basically led to the eventual oppression of the people in this area. However, once the power transitioned from the white minority government of both Rhodesia and British Southern Rhodesia to the, um, Af to the native African people of the area, they broke off the bird from the coat of arms representing them breaking ties from their colonial empires. The flag of Zimbabwe today is based off of the flag of the African National Union and once again contains the great Zimbabwe bird on it representing their native African heritage. The flag of Zimbabwe Rhodesia is a powerful example of a single aspect of a negative symbol becoming the unifying symbol for the entire freed people. The great Zimbabwe work showed the entire nation who the true leaders of the land were and why they needed to be broken off from their colonial and oppressive ties. Finally, a flag which many of you I'm sure recognize, the flag of Barbados and the symbol, the trident. So Barbados was originally colonized by the British in 1627. And, if, and slavery was heavily used in Barbados on plantations in order to help economically benefit uh, Britain and to help create um, and to help export things such as tobacco and cotton. However, eventually in 1834, slavery was abolished and in 1838, apprenticeships were abolished. And after this, Barbados decided to join the West Indies Federation, which was a treaty between multiple British colonies to gain independence. And in June 1966, they eventually gained independence. The flag of Barbados or the, can be originally seen up top, the blue British ensign, along with the seal of Barbados here, which was described as Britannia crowned and holding her trident, standing in a seashell and drawn by two seahorses, which represents Britain's rule over the seas. However, on the new flag, it broke off the trident from Britannia and placed it in the center. So this represents uh, the nation of Barbados breaking off their ties from their former colonial empire as well, because um, it was um, it was taking the rule of the rule over the seas away from the British Empire, who were holding the colony in this area during this time period, and now handing it over to the uh, um, Barbadian people. And um, it finally show represents breaking away from the final link to the empire, which caused the forced location and enslavement of many of the people on the island who are now the majority people who are holding government and are in charge of the country. The flag of Barbados represents a simple but powerful representation of independence and freedom, creating a unifying symbol for the many cultures who now reside in Barbados. All right, conclusion. So colonization began with Europe's effort with Europe's effort to hold economic control over trade routes. It began in Africa and Asia and expanded to the Americas and it affected almost the entire world. And the effects of colonialism remain in many forms today, especially within its flags. Many formerly colonized nations utilize symbols from these flags in order to help better represent their own people and their own culture. And there are many different ways that they help change the symbols of what were formerly oppressive nations in order to help represent their own people and help create a stronger, more unified nation and culture. And that's it. Questions from the audience? Anything uh, for Zach? Oh, no, okay. <laughs> um, were there, um, what were these four that you found, or did you just choose these four for the presentation? More? Um, I chose these four for the presentation because I think they best represented, like they're they like the most strongest, most compelling examples of symbols being used. The seal of Solomon, was it five pointed for the Muslims and then different for the Jewish people? Um, it's represented as both five-pointed and six-pointed. So the star found on the Rift Republic is also a seal of Solomon because it represents Islam and not Judaism. Um, you 
you consider ex French colonies like Cote d'Ivoire that adopted tricolor after independence part of the same category? Absolutely. Since going off of like the first couple of slides that I had, that the idea of a national symbol to create national pride came from Europe, and they could see this. These, these new nations could see this example being set by Europe. So perhaps by using a tricolor, they were also taking after what their European, what the European counterparts did. But I like that you mentioned the heraldry aspect, and I noticed that a lot of the former colony flags, you know, it often be the British ensign with the, the coat of arms of that colony. I was wondering, how did that coat of arms come to be for any of these examples you gave? Was that a purely colonial invention that uh, the European powers came to some sort of territory and said, this is the coat of arms that I want this colony to have? Or uh, did any of the oppressed native people ever have any kind of influence or say in what that coat of arms would be? Um, usually they didn't, and like I mentioned, Europe could, would sometimes use symbols which um, um, sort of pander to the native people to try to convince them like it was okay to be under us, such as the Great Zimbabwe bird. But usually these coat of arms were of the people who discovered these areas. Usually when it's a seal, it would be designated by the British government. But if it was, for example, in the case of Cecil Rhodes, that was his coat of arms, and that's why it was named Rhodesia. Actually, let's take one more question to make sure that we stick this. Yeah. Time. I just want to say I like your outfit. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. We'll go. Yeah. Okay. Very sorry. We'll get back. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I like your presentation, especially the part about the fact very interesting, as I am one of the very few today who are. Members of another. I'd like to continue the discussion that you lost offline in a way. You know, the whole bunch of stuff that you do. And I like the part of the other 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 part of the on the same top and line of using colonial symbols, would you see like the deliberate rejection of colonial symbols in favor of regional or uh, traditional symbols such as uh, Pan African colors, Pan Arab colors, or local uh, symbols? Would you see that as supporting your assertion here on like you know, the employment of colonial symbols and new nations, or would you see that as like an exception to this idea? Um, I wouldn't see this as, as an exception. I think, like I mentioned in the beginning, it was a very complex topic and there's always different interpretations on how to better unify a group of people. So in one interpretation, it could be the symbol that they use. In another interpretation, it could be symbols that other nations are using, such as the Pan-Arab colors or the Pan-African colors to create a better sense of unity between neighboring countries.